So uh, this is going to be a short but a little bit different presentation. So um, one of the things that um, so I'm going to I'm going to the title of the presentation is the age of disruption. This is something that I have been witnessing and observing passionately for as long as I'm um, you know consciously living. So. Uh, let me walk you through what I exactly mean. So, I have spent some accidental years in a big corporation. And um, this I have witnessed from first hand. So, I joined uh, Major Telecom, one of the biggest ones in the world, just as they were being disrupted heavily. So, I joined Telecom in 2011. And... I was present at many meetings where they were dismissing all of the things happening because they were too big to fail, they were too strong, and everything around them was awesome. And then 2012 came, and then all these WhatsApps, Vibers, Facebook Messenger, Snapchats completely obliterated. So 2012, 2018, 386 billion US dollars were removed from their PL. Completely. So, I cannot tell you how much shock this produced internally. And you know what's the funny part, part about this is that this happens to every industry, and every industry reacts in the same way. They're like rabbits, you know, facing the, you know, approaching lights. Um, so, let me let me ask you a question. Do you know which industry was the most innovative industry 100 years ago? Take a wild guess. Railway? It was electricity. So 100 years ago, there was this disruptive technology, which was to some people like magic. So electricity was the start and the beginning of everything. General Electric, um, Nikola Tesla, the other guy who stole his work, and all of the other things. And <laughs> So the, all of the things, uh, so now they, you remember that electricity exists maybe two times per year. When you pay the bill and you realize, oh shit, you know, that's a lot of money that I paid throughout the year. And when the electricity is gone. So basically, but one of the things that we forget constantly is that without electricity, the civilization as we know it wouldn't exist. And when electricity is gone, everything falls apart. So you have, throughout the years, in the last 100 or so years, people and businesses built business models on top of other people's business models. And this is what's happening constantly. So once a certain technology, certain market matures, there's another set of new, young, punky kids who come and build cool, sexy stuff. So the most innovative company for a long time was General Electric because they had light bulbs, because they had toasters. They invented a lot of things and they actually sold them in a very innovative way because before you couldn't buy a toaster you know, on the open market. You could only buy them from General Electric and many, many things like this we forget. So this is what I call... Um, this is what I call standing on the shoulder of giants because people build other people's business models on top of uh, their business models on top of other people's business models. And we completely forget every single instance of this. So remember that all of the things that we're doing right now, we are standing on someone else's technology, someone else's hard work, someone else's hard fails of the last 100 years and more. So, um, but let me, let me reset a little bit. So. We forget, we live our lives uh, really fast and we forget um, a lot of things about the world that we are living in right now. So, let me ask you a question. Do you know what the movie this is? Yeah, Back to the Future 2. Back to the Future 2. So, uh, my favorite movie of all times. So, I watched it probably like 900 times. And you know which, uh, which year was it filmed? 1986. 1986. I was six years old. I was completely blown away by this movie. So, um, you know, remember this scene, right? The future. So which year was, you know, this scene? 2015, October 21st, 2015. So what did they promise us in 2015? What kind of technology will be a day-to-day -day thing? 
flying skateboards, flying cars, nuclear powered uh, cars, washing machines, uh, nuclear powered, etc. etc. So, um, Imagine a six-year-old kid imagining, oh my God, 2015 is going to be so awesome, so awesome. But then, you know, you realize that someone 30 years ago, okay, maybe 40 years ago, um, imagined technology which exists today. It's not flying cars. It's VR. It's wearables, it's smart fabrics and all these things. And this is a constant reminder for me. I watch this movie, the whole series actually, at least once per year, just to remind myself how you know things are, are there. And I decided to build a timeline of my life to remind myself about this fact, because I was born in 1980. And each of these dots represent a reality that was for me something completely different that I didn't share with everyone else. And every one of us has exactly the same reality. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So I was zero years old when uh, Apple came out, 79 to 80. Apple, the biggest technology company right now, um, was started 39 years ago. And I was 11 when Mac OS 7 came out. And I was 14 when the first graphical browser came out. So. There's a lot of young people here, but there's also a lot of mature people here, like me. So, 1994, I was 14 years old, and this thing called Mosaic came out. Mosaic was the first graphical browser out there, ever. And it completely blew my mind, because I was a kid and I was studying in a, um, a library, because that was the only uh, place where you can browse the internet back then. Um, and I was completely blown out before. You know how we browsed the internet before 1994? Uh, we had gr uh, textual, textual browsers. It, we, I think it was called Lynx and Gopher. You would request it from a terminal, and then you would get like a lot of text, and then you would look at it, and then all of a sudden, bam, pictures, graphical interface. And I remember I was running back to my father, 14-year-old kid. It's like, Dad, this is so amazing. This is going to blow out everything. It's going to disrupt the whole world. Imagine. And he was so unimpressed. He was like, yes, son. I, you know, enjoy your enthusiasm. But who needs this? This is like for kids. Please, you know, study, you know, finish your uh, school, then graduate and do something useful with your life. This internet thing is like, that's a toy. So, um, and he was like that. He was like a construction engineer for him. There were like concrete stuff, like buildings and stuff for him. All of these, you know, imaginary stuff was not important. But then um, all of these dots for me were completely like, like the universe split in two. And one part of my friends and family immediate surrounding was living in their universe and I was living in the future universe where I could see the possibilities. And then let me take you, uh, 1998, I was 18 years old when Google came out. You remember what we used before Google? Who remembers search engines before Google? Yahoo, but what else? That's easy. Alta Vista, Ask Jeeves, all of this crazy stuff, which again, reminds me of this industry so many, uh, uh, so much. 1998, Google came out and they were a startup. They were like two, not kids, but two, I don't know, nerds in a university with some money and they were trying to reinvent the search. Mm, Yahoo back then was a mastodon. They were, you know, of the same magnitude as Google. And then some kids completely absorbed them, destroyed them. Again, for me, 2001, 21 years old, and I was a big mobile freak. I loved mobile phones. I don't know why, but, you know, it just alert to me. So 2001 was the year where the first commercial 3G was launched and was launched in Croatia. Uh, we're a very small country, four million people, so you know they tested, piloted a lot of technology there. I mean, if you screw up, you know, uh, if you screw up on four million people, it's fine. You know, if you screw up on 80 million people, it's it's bad. So we got to test the you know, 3G, which was, again, ran back to my dad and was like, Dad, look at this. This is amazing. You have the compendium of the whole human knowledge in the pocket of, uh, yeah, in your pocket. And he was like, yeah, son, but who needs that? Come on. You know, if you want to, you know, search the internet, you sit down behind a desk, you type it in, and that's fine. Nobody needs that. And for me, it just opened up endless possibilities. So each of these dots represented one of those. Uh, again, it's like, as you move on, 2006 was the year when YouTube was uh, invented. You remember, who remembers here, you know, 
the world without YouTube, 2005. How did it look like? How did we search the, the, uh, for videos? How did we watch videos? Remember? No, because we clicked, found it, downloaded, waited for half an hour, and then, oh, that's not the video that I wanted. So, but YouTube completely, utterly transformed uh, the way that we do a lot of things. You know what's the majority? Uh, so, w what do people use YouTube for mostly now? Education, exactly. So, 70% of YouTube usage is tutorials. Teach me how to crack a Wi-Fi network, play a guitar, snowboard. So my sister taught herself how to play a guitar when she was 17 or 18, but just by watching YouTube. So, I mean, that's one of these things. And I, I stopped sometime in 2014. I guess as you get older, uh, you know, some things become a little bit too new and too radical. <laughs> So that's the thing, uh, and I'm trying to, so Bitcoin was invented in 2009, again, 2009, 10 years ago. Remember 1994, 1994, 2014. So let me show you what this does to us. 2005, year before YouTube. You know, uh, this picture was taken in Vatican. This is the uh, crown, the, the, not the crowning, the inauguration of the German, uh, uh, Pope uh, Ratzinger. So, what what's distinct about this picture? It has one, two, and there's a guy here. Three phones and four. Four phones. 2005. In my head, 2005 was only like maybe six, seven years ago. In reality, it was <laughs> a little bit more. But look, so 2005, I still vividly remember 2005. I was 25, full of energy, just like becoming, you know, doing business. And let me show you same place, couple of years later, different Pope. So in just a couple of years, the world around us completely changes and completely transforms. And mobile phone. So this is something that completely and utterly changed the way that you know, our civilization functions. The only thing that is with you 24 hours a day is a mobile phone. Where do you keep your phone when you go to sleep? Here. You plug it in and that's the first thing you, know, you look at when you wake up and that's the last thing you see when you go to sleep. So if you ask my father, that's horrible. That's the end of civilization. It completely dehumanizes us. And uh, for me, this is something that, again, shows us how powerful the technology is and how adaptive human beings can be. Because for them, for us, this is something completely normal. Every morning we wake up and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we look the same to us. But then somebody shows you a picture of you 10 years ago and then you say, oh shit. Oh, I'm ugly now. I was beautiful back then. <laughs> but um, the reason for it, and uh, but let me let, let me give you another example. You know uh, where this picture was taken? Take a wild guess. Hong Kong. Okay, so for you who have been to Hong Kong, <laughs> this was 2014. This was the first um, first. Uh, um, protest there, and the distinct of this picture is very specific. Uh, all of these white dots are mobile phones, and what happens is, from a telecom perspective, I was a guy from telecom, I can tell you, this amount of people there, it takes a lot of money to, you know, uh, make everyone have the internet. So, billions and billions of euros and dollars were built for the infrastructure. And then something happens like, you know what's FireChat? FireChat is an app that you download and you can communicate instantly. And you create a mesh network between people uh, around you without the internet. So you create your own infrastructure in seconds. If one person has access to the internet, everyone else has one. So this is just a way to show you how technology completely transforms the thing. And the reason why for this is this, technology became the new rock and roll. When I was a kid, you know what was cool when I was a kid? I was maybe, I don't know, 13, 14. Kids of my age were having rock bands. So if you wanted to be cool, you would play in a band. 
on matinees probably, you know. And somebody was asking, you know, it's like, what do you do? It's like, well, I play in a band, you know, we play Led Zeppelin or something like this. Kids these days, they start startups, they build technology. For them, this is cool because this can change the world because my generation believed that rock and roll can change the world, which is bullshit. Um, and I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So my sister, I, so I use my family a lot because they're like the biggest, like best test, test subjects for me. My father, my sister. So my youngest sister, she's 14 years younger than me. That's a gen almost a whole generation. So uh, when I was a kid, in, we had these posters in our room. Uh, you, you remember Bravo, the magazine, uh, musical one, I think it was German. And you had these posters in the middle. You had, I don't know, Samantha Fox, uh, Michael Jordan, John Bon Jovi. They were my room was filled with them when I was like 12 or 13. So I walk into my sister's room. She was 14, 15, something like this. And I stop because I see you know, two posters, which in my kind of brain were not supposed to be on that wall because, you know, they're weird. I mean, it's weird that they are there. Can you take a guess? So she's 25 now. Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs was one, Elon Musk was the second. And I'm like, what, why do you have these ugly people on the wall? <laughs> where's, where's Justin Bieber? Where is Luka Modric or I don't know? He's like, why, why would I have them on the wall? And my generation was like, w what do you mean? <laughs> they're, but w w what are they doing with, with uh, they're, they're entertainers, they're like clowns. They chase a ball and they play and entertain. These people are changing the way that we do things, the change that our uh, civilization functions. And this is actually true. So for me, it was a kind of a revealing experience that, you know, I probably should open my brain a little bit more to kind of changes. Um, but one of the things that is super, you know, interesting for me is as I walk and talk with people who are building new stuff on new uh, technologies, uh, there is always this um, uncertainty and lack of self-worth because Finance, that's a big industry. Telecom, that's a big industry. You cannot compete with them because they have billions and they have so much experience. But let me, let me, let me ask you a couple of questions just to kind of shine the light a little bit. You know which country in Europe has the uh, largest mobile penetration rate? Take a wild guess. Except for the star fleets, you know the answer. <laughs> Come on. The last row. Kosovo, no, <laughs> but close. So it's Montenegro. Montenegro, a country uh, that has 2.7 mobile phones per a human being. It's amazing. So it's not Germany, it's not Sweden, it is Montenegro, a country of 650,000 people. And I'll tell you a bit later why. Country in Europe that has the highest uh, speed of internet. Okay, we have Bulgarians and Romanians here, so it's Bulgaria and Romania. It's not Finland, it's not Sweden, it's not Germany, it's not the most developed countries of Europe. It is the least ones. You know why? <laughs> it's true, sorry. guy. <laughs> but, do, I mean, Romania has 47% rural population. 47%, 5 million people are living on the villages in Romania. And still they have the fastest speed of internet. So they have a barn with animals and they live a life very similar to the life that people lived like 50 years ago and they have the fastest speed of internet. I visited my friend, Cosmin, one of my best friends, and I visited his mother once and I was shocked because, you know, it's like imagine a village and then imagine that you have 250 megabits in that village. And he came to Poland with me and he was furious. He said, look, this, this is... Thievery. They're thieves. They want 25, uh, 25 euros for 25 megabits. That's insane. You know, that's the price that I get in Romania for 250. So that's the thing. The, we believe that our civilization, that the West, is something that is going to, you know, still stay in uh, the first spot. That all of the innovation is going to come through there. But guess what? That's not true. And this is the, this is the reason. The reason is that... Montenegro and Romania, they jumped over a whole completely, um, they skipped generations of technologies 
and they implemented, for example, in uh, uh, Montenegro, they jumped over NMT, the first mobile technology, and jumped directly to uh, 3G. Romania. You remember dial-up? What is, when, when somebody says dial-up, what do you, what's the first thing you would think about? Exactly. It's like this uh, robot's dying from a modem. I used to, when I was a kid, I used to, you know, suffocate my modem uh, with a pillow so I don't wake up people, you know, in my sleep. Romanians, they have no idea what, is, uh, what this is. You know, I was talking to him, he's like, oh, you remember the sound? And he's like, what? What sound? So they went directly to cable, directly to optics. You know, the first internet in 1993, 1994 with them was like 10 times faster than us because they jumped over a whole set of technologies. That's the thing. So countries which adopt the newest technology and remove the legacy, they're the ones who are going to ride the next wave. So a couple of, again, mind breakers. Do you know what's, uh, can you imagine the biggest number um, in your head? Take a while, get, give me some huge, huge number. Google, okay, except for Google. That's cheating. So um, I checked what is the current total amount of data storage in the world. And it's around 18 zettabytes. I didn't know what's a zettabyte, so I Googled it. And a zettabyte, if you would print out every piece of information um, on an A4 uh, paper and stack it on top, you would reach the moon and back and it doubles every 18 months. The amount of data that we storage somewhere. Imagine what kind of electricity, infrastructure, power do we need for something like that. Imagine that. And you know how much of that data is utilized somewhere? Less than 1%. 0.8% of that data that is, you know, we're like bloody hamsters. You know, we hoard the data, we never use it. Imagine what this, will do to us in a couple of years. So, Facebook. So, this is like polarizing effect. Again, remember this. This was the first network that connected more than one billion human beings into one communication protocol. So, and it did one very distinct thing. It created empathy between human beings. Yes, they're evil, they steal our data, they resell our data, they exploit, but it, as a consequence of this, it created connections between many, many human beings. What's the default for majority of people? How do they stay connected once they meet someone? Facebook. Why? Because it's the easiest one and it's already connected. So now they have more than four, human, uh, four billion human beings connected in all of their networks. But what was the most popular social network before Facebook? MySpace. Who still has a MySpace account? One guy. Okay, we have one guy who has a MySpace account, which is amazing because... <laughs> okay. Old school all the way. So, but that's the thing. Everybody believes that Facebook is here to stay forever. And everybody acts like this. But it's not true. Because I witnessed all of these things. MySpace was Facebook before Facebook. And everybody, when Facebook was coming out, everybody was like, no, I have a MySpace page. I invested like a lot of time. I have a lot of friends. You know, I have a lot of gifts on, on my MySpace. But then, now they're dead. They do not exist. They exist, but nobody uses it. <laughs> but that's the thing. So this is something that you remember, that there's always going to be another Facebook after the Facebook, because after you invent a new fact, it becomes uh, a new thing, it becomes a default. If that thing dies, there's going to be multiple new people building on top of them. Uh, you know what this is? It's a baby. <laughs> yeah. So this is another illustration how technology completely, you know, changes our lives. So um, my, I have a daughter. When she was born, I was super paranoid. I was like really stressed out. I was not handling it well. Um, so this is a baby, but this is a Weibo. It's called a Weibo. It's like this little um, body. They call it body in, in Croatia. And this is a heartbeat sensor and uh, some other vital signs. So um, this is something that tracks, you know what's a sudden death syndrome? So 
um, for those of you who didn't know, sudden death syndrome is a syndrome where, where um, I, um, an infant uh, just stops breathing um, without uh, any apparent reason. We don't know why, we just stops breathing. And it lasts until maybe 16 months uh, of life. And I, when I read about it, I was super paranoid. I was like, oh my God, I, w I would wake her up at like three in the morning to see if she's breathing. Um, <clears throat> but this shows you that technology that we take for granted just kind of empowers it. So if, if you realize that this is happening, you can, you know, you can help it. You can basically resuscitate. For me, this is a symbol of how technology completely transforms our lives and we take it as a trivial thing, very trivial thing. So um, just to conclude, the thing that is happening around us is the following. So our current political economical system was invented 200 years ago. That's not far away. All of our mechanisms, all of our laws were built back then and improved over and over again. But it is 21st century. It was then, back then, the benefits of this was that massive organizations, centralized uh, governance was the biggest innovation back then because nation states were born 200, 250 years ago. And the leap that, that they achieved was amazing. But now, what's happening right now is something that they're getting disrupted. So a revolution which is not visible, just like the, remember the timeline? My father, for him, he only understands one world. And this new world is strange and it's probably not gonna happen for everyone else. So endless choice right now, if you want to read a book, watch a movie, find a funny cat video, you can do it instantly. 20 years ago, education, 50 years ago, education. If you want to learn a language, if you want to learn how to read. So endless choice, digital technology, automation, AI, so much more. This is happening. And this is what's happening in parallel. The economy as we know it. Milan mentioned the smartest way of money ever existed. Yes, but so much more. Economy, identity, political allegiances. Even the essence of what is to be a human are being reset and reinvented. And again, our society does not, you know, keep up. So. This is what's going to happen with the current setup. Um, it's going to stay for a while, but just like any other legacy old dying system, it's going to die out very soon because the new way, the new world is going to become slowly more efficient uh, as we go. And then we're going to realize it's redundant. It's not going to happen through blood and revolution. It's going to happen by passing of time. So. Technology-led restructuring of our politics and society. This is what's happening right now. And this is basically, you know, what we all are doing here. We in eternity, we in the blockchain industry, this is what's happening. The whole world is going to change rapidly and completely very soon. And last, to conclude, you know what this is? <laughs> so it's a pyramid, and um, you know when they were uh, built? Yeah, a long time ago, 10,000 years ago. So something created 10,000 years ago is still standing here. So what kind of tools did they have? Yeah, they had lasers, bulldozers, you know. The only thing they had was human labor, like manual, like, okay, slaves, but that's beside the point. Human labor and human ingenuity and math. So something that they have built with nothing still stands after 10,000 years ago. So it's never about the tools. And I'm emphasizing this because everybody's telling is like, oh, it's about the tools, it's about the tools. It's not about the tools. It's about the ingenuity that you bring in. It's about the inventions that you push strong. And it's about this. If you do not adapt, you're absorbed and you die. And this is all, you know, the end result of the whole thing. If you are like a telecom from the beginning of the story, if you're like the electricity producer from the beginning of the story, you will become irrelevant and a dumb pipe because it is inevitable. 
Thank you very much.